Hello everyone, welcome to Torah for Women Ministry. I'm Judith Garten and I'm here today to talk to you about a topic that can get somewhat heated at times. It's an interesting one to say the least and it can be difficult to discuss because oftentimes when I bring this up I get the accusation that I am believing in either replacement theology or I am anti-Semitic. Neither is the truth, so let's explore this with an open mind and open heart, and let's get going. Now, we just finished up a time period in the year where families are overwhelmed and stressed beyond measure about keeping tradition. This time period begins probably around the 15th or so of November and goes through January 2nd. For some people, it actually goes toward the middle of the month of January on the Gregorian calendar. Now, don't get me wrong, traditions can be wonderful events. They can be emotionally moving experiences that we learn in childhood and bring forward into our adult lives. We often teach our own children and even grandchildren these traditions and they can be loving reminders of where we started and what our ancestors were like. Traditions can be from various places in our lives. They can be familial, where we learn them from family. They can be national. We have national traditions here in the United States, such as Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, Veterans Day. Those are just a few examples. Traditions can be personal as well. Traditions can also be religious, or any combination of all of these aspects can be tied together in tradition. Now I want to try and focus this teaching though on what we would consider religious traditions. Why? Mainly because at the time of year we just wrapped up with the overwhelming permeation of Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, and all of the traditions old and new which go along with those. This topic has been on my mind for quite some time now as we went through even the fall feasts, especially Sukkot, and then into our American tradition of Thanksgiving, then into the winter season where we incorporated all of those amazing traditions that we grew up with as children. You know, a large number of people are being led away from following the typical holiday traditions that were celebrated when they were children. Those traditions, which are both secular and religious, many now deeply in their own hearts believe that Christmas has nothing to do with Christ. Yeshua is our Savior, and that is beyond a shadow of a doubt. And people recite one phrase every year at that time of Christmas. They tell you Jesus is the reason for the season. They even go so far as to Christianize things that have some pagan origins or secular origins. Some years Christmas time can be particularly painful for me individually to have given up because my childhood was so deeply immersed in their traditions that wrap around that holiday. It was my father's favorite time of year. We spent a lot of time together with family growing up, and even now there's often an ache in my heart after Thanksgiving. Sometimes it falls in before Thanksgiving because I miss those traditions. I used to do those with my parents, and I shared them with my children, and my children now share them with my grandchildren, so sometimes that ache settles in. So Christmas and Easter are the two most prominent seasons we see people walking away from in their faith system. They don't walk away from their faith, mind you, so don't mistake that. And they still deeply believe in Yeshua and His Word. However, the religious system, the denomination that they lived in for a long time, they often feel comfortable walking away from because it is immersed now in so many different um, traditions and belief systems and people want to get that from their lives. Yet the irony of it is because our lives are so steeped in tradition from various places, like I said, our nation, family, friends, community, and the like, we long for things such as tradition that are now missing from our lives when we go the direction we've gone. Often when we are led to decide on following the biblical feast days, we crave the trappings that we used to have, or we have a deep desire to find new trappings and replace the old with the new. All the accoutrements which are tied to those holidays, especially when we so deeply miss the traditions of our past. Where do people turn to fill the void? Well, 
I've been seeing over the last few years a very deep and strong trend of people turning to the traditions of Judaism. So now do you see why this is going to be an interesting discussion? Because we have to be able to discern the difference between the religiosity of Judaism, the faith, the denomination, and the biblical aspects of being Jewish as Yeshua was. Let's walk this journey together, but are you ready? Jim and I have watched people as they walk away from their denomination and they toss out Christmas and Easter, Halloween. Suddenly they will believe that Judaism, the religion, and its leaders hold all the truths regarding how to celebrate the biblical feast days. They also believe they hold all the truths about celebrating the months, the new year, the real new year, they say. And people grab hold of those teachings from websites, books, manuals, videos, friends, talks, all kinds of areas, and they throw themselves into the traditions of Judaism. Traditions of Judaism can often be very beautiful, and they can feel deeply spiritual. People might explore if the traditions are right and wrong, often from websites which have highly rabbinic stance on things, or explore if the traditions might have pagan roots, yet most times, instead of studying fully, they will study only the goodness of the traditions. We see people constantly simply grabbing hold and replacing old traditions with newly discovered ones. People who would before complain about the expense of Christmas and the tradition and the pressure and the stress of Christmas turn to Hanukkah and spend just as much money on Hanukkah gifts and decorations and whatnot and foods. It's merely replacing one thing for another. Um, kind of like a form of replacement theology, wouldn't you say? We have to be careful of this and we have to be able to discern. But if we don't study, we won't discern. Sadly, this is also when people start rationalizing everything they chose to adopt. Claiming that Judaism, the religion, holds all the answers. It holds all the truth preserved by sages since the time of Yeshua and even before and that is what you hear from someone who defends the traditions of Judaism without knowing exactly from where they came or what time they were implemented. But you could say the same thing about the early church fathers. Imagine, are you ready? Tradition has been around for centuries, preserved by the early church fathers. And when they say it this way, it's always followed by a negative and finding fault with what became the Roman Catholic Church and various other denominations throughout time. Now, isn't it ironic that within the walls of one religious system, we'll say Christianity, people will rant about the open acceptance and displays of pagan traditions. But within the other religion, Judaism, we excuse, justify, and ignore it, even defend it. Now what can we do? We can do what we must do. You see, the common belief is that the only church or religion which has kept the traditions alive since ancient Israel is the religion of Judaism. People add elements of Judaism to Shabbat, Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Sukkot, and even Rosh Kodesh. These elements they add come directly from the practices within Judaism, the religion. Whether it's Messianic Judaism, Reformed, Orthodox, or any of the sects and subsects in those organizations, families add traditions without even considering from where they came. Now I'm going to give you a quick caution here. You might at this point have that anger bubbling up inside of you, but don't stop listening to the video yet. Hear me out to the end, please. Interestingly enough, traditions of Judaism often become sacred cows for a lot of families. Over the years, we've watched countless people go on and on vehemently about how much better life is with these Jewish rigid traditions. And they will vehemently state how we better get our Lulav and Etrog for Sukkot 
or don't forget your boxes of matzah for unleavened bread and make sure they're kosher not just kosher kosher for Passover and only those I go into that in other videos and and whatnot and I'll share links below I've also written blogs about um, kosher for Passover and very soon I'll be doing another video on halacha and what you really need to know about halacha but for right now are these traditions actually biblical are they pagan are they considered mitzvot do I have to follow mitzvot are they commandments these traditions should we treat them more holy than the traditions of Christian churches which we threw away or should we treat them the same as we did Christian traditions that we found were not of God? Interesting list of questions, isn't it? We're going to be walking together through a series of videos, starting with this one, from Shabbat to the feast days. We're also going to include those days which we celebrate called Purim and Hanukkah. We're going to talk about each individual celebration and what the Bible says ought to be done on those times or days. And for this initial discussion, we are talking in a more generalized coverage simply because I want you to understand. I would like to draw a picture for you, a better picture of the possibilities which are available to believers instead of following just another fa false tradition. Recently, I took part in a brief discussion on social media on the premise that many people have decided to remove the aspects of Judaism from their feast celebrations, just like they removed Christmas and Easter from their lives. They're not removing the feast days or the feast celebrations. They are merely removing the traditions, which are not biblical, eliminating those details which they feel are fully unbiblical because they're not mentioned in God's word. And people, some people are taking it to that extent, or some of the traditions may be perceived as frivolous and unnecessary. However, there are also activities and traditions which have been discovered to have come from less than righteous beginnings. In this case, this final case, many feel it is not worthy of Abba to do those things in his honor which are unacceptable. This is the same principle they applied to Christian traditions. And that's my concern, why we are not applying it across the board. Now I have to say, I often avoid these discussions on social media because they can get out of hand, out of control. So I don't often comment anymore, but when I do comment, I pick and choose very carefully because those conversations I actually enjoy participating in from time to time. And it's wonderful to see if the families who are following obsequiousness or applying obsequiousness in their life, which is legalism, see if they'll change. I love to see when people realize they can relax and enjoy traditions that are just traditions and there's no tie to unrighteousness or paganism. I love seeing them learn of new and exciting experiences that they would like to follow. I particularly enjoy discussions where there is no shoving anyone's beliefs down the other person's throats or forcing others to feel the way you do. I have to say, one of my least favorite things to hear during one of these discussions, yet I see it often enough to, to, to have done a video on it. And you're in the middle of a discussion about traditions and this statement comes up. Oh. Okay, I see. You're just not there yet. Where? Where am I not? Where you think you have um, a better knowledge, no more, or whatnot than everyone else? That's a dangerous area to get into, and I'll share the link to the video below. The recent conversation that I got into actually led to probably two or three more conversations along similar lines. And the first one started with the focus being on one statement that if we remove the Jewishness from the feasts, it makes the feasts dull. They become empty and unedifying. The comment continued by stating that people simply have a feast with people, sit around, do nothing, because the Torah does not specifically state what traditions 
or activities you do on the feast days or during that time. It's implied that if you don't do Jewish things, the items and traditions from Judaism, you literally do nothing with the people you invite over. I had this picture of people sitting around a large dinner table staring at each other blankly and eating like robots, just... Can you imagine? I don't think any of our feast days have been like that at all. <laughs> I don't know about other families who are eliminating the false traditions, but I do know how Jim and I celebrate the feast days and honor them. In fact, we've tried to ensure there's a lot of activity, study, spending time in prayer, celebration, and enjoyment. And we've tried over the years to share it with friends and relatives. Clearly, that's different from the visual presented in the comments on this, that post on social media. Apparently, many believe eliminating false traditions, no matter where they originate, would be the worst thing for believers to ever do. Unless, of course, you consider families who come up with their own traditions or activities and proceed with the feast day activities, doing everything and anything except false tradition. Those of us who have walked away from the traditions of the religion of Judaism are often frowned upon. I don't know if you've seen that. So let's unpack things a little bit here and go through this a little at a time. If we remove the Jewishness from the feast, it makes them dull, empty, and unedifying. Being Jewish is a beautiful gift. Being of any culture is a beautiful gift. Each piece of my own part of my family's past is a beautiful gift. And not one of those pieces diminishes the beauty of the other pieces. There used to be a, a term that they used about, about a dog that you pick up at a shelter. They'd say it was Heinz 57. Well, I'm a Heinz 57. My background is so diverse, <laughs> I should say. There is German, Hungarian, English, Scottish, and yes, even Jewish. I have had countless people over the years turn to me though and ask me, I'll bet you feel so special having Jewish ancestry. Honestly, no. It is just a part of me. Do I treasure the memories that my mom shared that she didn't realize were Jewish in tradition? I, I, tr I cherish those memories. I love the stories she told me before she passed away about my grandmother making Purim cookies around my mom's birthday every year. That's special to me, but it doesn't elevate me in any way above you. It doesn't make me more precious than you. It doesn't make me more precious in God's eyes, more precious than my British side or my Scottish side or my German side or my Hungarian side. All of those pieces put together are me and there's more. <laughs> I mean, it's phenomenal how far my family reached. That ancestry is what makes me, me. And it's fun to learn of those different traditions and cultures. I enjoy that. Each of these cultures has its own beautiful traditions. Some I enjoy sharing with my children, yet other traditions I have blatantly come to avoid because they are pagan. And one example I'm going to give you is a very personal one. It was a very difficult one for me to make, a very difficult decision. I used to create what they call pisanki eggs. I was at one point making my way up the ladder of success, literally, in that art form, and I sold pisanki as small as quail, as large as ostrich, worldwide. I currently know that there are my designs in Malta, there are my designs in England, in European countries, as well as in Australia and throughout the United States, Canada, and Mexico. I enjoyed that. It was peaceful to me. It was a part of my heritage. Um, I learned it actually in a homeschooling workshop with my children. They didn't pick it up. I did. And I got very good at it. And I loved it with all my heart. I would sit up till 2, 3 o'clock in the mornings sometimes just drawing a new design or um, waxing and dyeing. However, one day I realized that the art form Although I did not follow pagan traditions within the art itself, it was distinctly pagan in heritage, tradition, and use. 
In fact, even people today in these modern times have been known to credit those eggs as talisman. They've given them as gifts, as talisman, as if they have some special power. Powers of what? Fertility, blessing, and even curses, believe it or not. And I do know of people who have gifted <laughs> Pisanki eggs to others with evil purpose. And yes, they did believe it contained that curse. Although I love the art form very much and their tradition of doing it, and I adored the elderly woman who taught the kids and I how to do it, I gave it up. I gave it up through a lot of prayer and crying because it was not a direction I wanted to continue down creating pagan items, even though I did not attribute any paganism to them and I even prayed over them and blessed them, I recognized it was not righteous. I can, however, create many other things of beauty using the talents Abba gave me, and I'm experimenting with that, ways which do not represent paganism. I can give up the paganism, but keep my talent. The same thing can be applied to celebrating your feast days. The feasts are not specifically a part of Judaism. They don't belong, they aren't owned by Judaism. They are Yahweh's. We can purge all celebrations of all that is pagan or questionable and still keep that which is good and right and true. Can you imagine that? Now the next part of the comment was people simply have a feast with people and do nothing because the Torah does not specifically state what traditions or activities to do. In my experience, I have read all the feast days in the Bible and I have found things which are appropriate that we can do. How? Well, for example, a couple of the feasts tell us to simply celebrate. Well, how do you celebrate? Do you honestly need specific step-by-step -step instructions to learn how to celebrate? I doubt it. I believe celebration comes from the biblical designation Yahweh has assigned to that feast and you can celebrate. For example, to me, the Day of Atonement is a sacred day. It's a calm day. It's a quiet day. And that we should be willing to set aside everything of the world for that 24 hours and just spend time focusing on the atonement and what it was for, for us. We, we need that. We need that focus. We need to recognize Yeshua in that feast. That is how I celebrate it. That is how I honor it. Is that a day for hooting and hollering? Maybe. For me, it's not. It's a day of quiet peacefulness. But for someone else, it might be. How do you honor and celebrate the Day of Atonement? However, what about the feasts where celebration might mean exactly that? Hooting and hollering. Sukkot is a time of celebration where I could picture families getting together and getting loud. I have one friend who actually, um, during that time period, around that time period, holds an outdoor concert on their on their property which is very large and they can do that they have people of the neighborhood in their small town come over and they have dinner together and it is just a wonderful experience that's a little bit of hooting and hollering for Sukkot you could do that but if you want a day during Sukkot I mean goodness the feast day is so long and there's a Shabbat at the beginning of Shabbat in the end and usually one in the middle so imagine your Shabbat what do you do on Shabbat you have that sacred day at the beginning of Sukkot and the end of Sukkot. What do you do? Take that time and look, experiment, decide for yourself now. Now what about Yom Teruah? You know it's the Feast of Trumpets and you know pretty much everyone is going to be getting loud. Why? They grab their shofars and their trumpets and their horns and they blow them. You can get more into this as you walk through each and every feast day, step by step. And I plan to try and help you with some ideas as well. But even the Sabbath, we can find things that are not 
requirements of Judaism and we can find ways to honor those days and have fun in them and find Abba in them. Now finally, the, the comment was that families who come up with their own traditions and activities then proceed with the feast days activities doing every and anything except that of Judaism. What is wrong with that? I don't have to follow the traditions of a religion to honor God's feasts. I don't. Can I? Depends on the tradition. I have one thing I'm going to talk to people about coming up and that's challah bread. I have so many sisters who insist that Shabbat is not Shabbat unless they have challah. It has to be twisty bread. They will break their necks, ruin their prep day, ruin their week, making sure they have challah for Shabbat. Hoping I can help you learn to relax. Now, when people say that they're frustrated with people who come up with their own traditions and activities, this is often presented as though it's some kind of an offense. I do not understand why it would be an offense for you to come up with traditions that you do during, I'm going to pick Sukkot again because that's one of my favorite times of year. Every family has traditions that they do of their own to celebrate countless other big events throughout the years, from the birth of a baby to a wedding to a baptism. Add your own event in here. I don't do the same things you do and you don't do the same things as the neighbor does and so on down the line. We might find that some things are too difficult for us to do because of where we live. If you live in an area where it gets a lot of snow early and doing Sukkot outside with neighbors might be difficult. How about hurricane season and you've got one coming? There are things that could complicate life. Applying your own family traditions to these events would be considered some horrific affront to certain people. Now let me make this clear. Applying your own family traditions to the feast days, it's not considered some horrific affront. It's not considered a horrible attack on someone else's beliefs because you choose not to do their traditions. So why would we think that those are offensive to Yahweh? These are biblical times that we want to celebrate, and there's so much of Yeshua in each and every one. We need to look for the shadow pictures. If you're not familiar with the shadow pictures of Christ in the feast days, that's a great thing for you to do with your family and start. Refresh that every year. You know, even during the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, his people were told to teach the children of that time forever. Why? Because we need to remember that time forever. I cannot believe that people would honestly think that the only thing we can do during the feast times are what the religion of Judaism preaches to be done. One thing I don't want to do is leave you hanging with no plan of action. Someone once taught me, don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution. And so those last few minutes were presenting problem. What about solution? How do we apply what I have taught? Well, first, you need to be willing to apply the same depth of examination to new traditions you want to adopt. The same kind of microscope should be applied to any new traditions as were applied to the ones you left behind. Whether from a new faith base, new friends, new teachers, wherever the tradition comes from, wherever, whatever you choose to follow, be willing to investigate it just as you did before. Don't fall prey to false teachings, no matter where it comes from. Number two, sit with your family. Start with your spouse. Discuss the next upcoming celebration time for feast day. For us, it will be Purim soon. Where do you find Purim in scripture? What is this all about? What was the purpose behind Purim? Why was it implemented as basically an additional celebration added to their walk. Have a family conversation about what to incorporate into that celebration. One thing I know is that there is an annual tradition carried out by some sects of Judaism 
During Purim, that would be forbidden in, under any other circumstances throughout the rest of the year. Should you do that as part of your celebration, take a hard look at it before you do it. And we'll be going over more of that in a, in a couple weeks because I'll be discussing Purim in particular after we go over Shabbat. Number three, the first place you should turn for instructions is the Word of God, period. <laughs> End of discussion on that one. What does the Word of God say about your celebrating the feast or the day you are studying with your family? Make a list down one side of the piece of paper and leave room to list ideas you want to include as new things to celebrate. And then write a description of each one, how you're going to celebrate it. The most important part is number four. How does that feast time foreshadow Yeshua? What does it say about him? What shadow pictures can you and your family grasp from the feasts or from Shabbat? He fulfills the law, but how? The feasts are a part of the law, so how does he fulfill the feasts? How can you celebrate? Celebrating is such a broad open word and when people say they have to follow someone else's traditions to be fulfilled in celebrating, that saddens me. We need to be ready to apply the Word of God in our lives, so how are we going to do that? For one, we should not condemn or be harsh with the people who follow Judaism. We should instead be honest and direct and invite them to challenge themselves. We must be good examples of Yeshua in all things, in all areas of our lives, and including here. If you're not going to find fault, scream, yell, rant, and rave, and be a Torah terrorist, as has become the common terminology, to a Christian, you're not going to be a Torah terrorist. Don't be a Torah terrorist to those who are following Judaism. We need to be kind in what we teach. How else will people learn of Abba's true character, if not through the example he is in others. So we need to be that example. Remember, Jews are still his people, as are we. He came to teach and to save them. We do not in any way replace them, which is why I said it's not replacement theology. We do, however, need to live out a life in Christ to show them how to follow him and that they too may be saved. Many who follow Judaism don't believe in Yeshua. We need to be his example. I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I didn't go into a lot of detail giving you solution, but I did give you a couple things that you can apply right now and start doing before the next celebration comes up. And remember, celebrate is a big word, and in that is contained so many aspects you could do. Just remember, look it up research it and not just from locations which give you permission or authorize or make you feel good about what you're doing. Look into the history and please remember subscribe, turn on notifications. I'm really working hard to introduce a number of new teachings as well as finish out older ones such as the prayer journal series. I just did a few um, episodes for that. You don't want to miss any of the new exciting activity that is going to be coming up and share it with your friends. Now, in our next discussion on truth versus tradition, we will be going over Shabbat, and I will be talking about that, that challah bread. I want to cover it before we discuss Purim, so I'm hoping I can get this done quickly, simply because Shabbat comes every week, and because I see sisters so stressed and so frustrated and so beaten down when they don't accomplish all that they believe they have to do to honor Shabbat. And just imagine if you take to heart the things I've said and don't trade the traditions of one religion for the traditions of another religion. Look, study, and open your heart in prayer. If some of what I have shown you will free you from the stress and the pressure of obsequiousness, it could fulfill your life in more ways than you could possibly dream. I hope this has helped you. Blessings and Shalom.